Why do I stand up here? Anybody? To feel taller. No. Thank you for playing, Mr. Dalton. I stand upon my desk to remind myself that we must constantly look at things in a different way. You don't believe me? Come see for yourselves. Come on. Come on. Just when you think you know something, you have to look at it in another way. Even though it may seem silly or wrong, you must try. Now, when you read, don't just consider what the author thinks. Consider what you think. Boys, you must strive to find your own voice. But the longer you wait to begin, the less likely you are to find it at all. Thoreau said most men lead lives of quiet desperation. Don't be resigned to that. Break out. Don't just walk off the edge like lemmings. Look around you. Welcome to Successful Dropout. This podcast is for the outliers, the innovators, the rebels, those that dare to dream and act on their dreams. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Join me as we find out what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. What is up, Successful Dropouts? Get stoked because today on the show we have Chandler Bolt. Chandler is the author of five best-selling books, including Book Launch and his most recent book titled Published. He's also the founder and CEO of Self-Publishing School, the number one online resource for writing your first book. Through his books, training videos, and self-publishing school, he's helped thousands of people on their journey to writing their first book. So Chandler, man, that's the intro I have for you, but tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, so um, like you kind of just mentioned, I run a company called Self Publishing School. We're an online training program. We teach people how to write, market, and publish their first book. Really, how to go from blank page to best selling author in ninety days. Uh, it's fast pace, uh, and it probably sounds like a gimmick, but it, I mean, we consistently hit that uh, with people. So, uh, my kind of my background is uh, I'm obviously a college dropout. Uh, and also, I was a horrible English student, and I hated writing, and I wasn't any good at it. But I learned how to write a book. <laughs> the book was successful. Uh, it brought in close to seven thousand dollars in the first month, and continued to bring in thousands of dollars a month in passive income. And so, it's one of those things where wow. my life changed the day that I published my book, uh, and I saw all these opportunities open up for me. And then. I helped a friend do it, and same thing happened to him. And then people just kept asking about it, and that's really what led to me uh, starting self-publishing school. And you know, we we officially launched in February last year. Um, went from zero to 1.32 million last year. Uh, we'll do about two million this year, uh, and I feel like we're really just getting warmed up. So we're just getting started, and uh, our our ultimate goal uh, is to put the publishers out of business. Uh, and to show people that self-publishing isn't just a option, but it's the best option. So. That's fantastic, man. So what, what was this first book that you wrote? Uh, it's called The Productive Person. Uh, I almost am embarrassed to even say it because it's like, you know, I always tell people that writing your first book, uh, it's like learning how to ride a bike. Once you do it, yeah. you'll never forget it, and you'll never forget how to do it, and you can easily do it again. But we all probably think back to the first time that we rode a bike, and it was a pretty rough experience, uh, right? So that's the way it was for me, but I mean, people seemed to like it. It seemed to sell well, but now I'm like, man, I was such a horrible rider, <laughs> uh, and so I can, I can hardly even imagine. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, just, it's just funny to talk about it now, but that was the first book, and it's basically all about – uh, productivity hacks for entrepreneurs and for people who control their schedule, who want to be be more productive, but they struggle with work life balance. And and so gotcha. it was lessons that I learned from running my first six figure business it, while also being a full time college student, uh, while also being a young life leader and having just tons of demands on my time. And so it was kind of like what I learned from that pressure cooker of that situation yeah. and and lessons I learned and productivity hacks and things like that. So cool, man. So uh, here at Successful Dropout, we have an audience of obviously dropouts, opt-outs, but just generally people that kind of think outside of the out of the box and are looking for alternative ways to um, educate themselves, get into a career, uh, kind of live life on their own terms. Um, I have a question, and that's: Could you go over the reasons why would somebody be interested in, in writing and publishing their own book? What are the benefits to somebody? Oh gosh, there's so many. I mean, for for one thing, a, a book is the new business card. So it gets you in the door. It helps you have conversations, and it helps you be taken seriously. Uh, not only that, but a book is I like to call it the silent salesman. So it's a silent salesman for you and your company. So when someone picks up my book, 
not only am I able to educate them and they're giving me hours of their undivided attention, but this book is selling them on me and on my company. So I call it the silent salesman because it's not saying anything uh, out loud, but the whole time we're building a relationship over the course of hours of their time. Uh, at the end, oftentimes people will say, hey, uh, you know, maybe they hate me, but uh, maybe they like me. And they say, hey, I like this Chandler <laughs> guy and I want to do business with him. Right. And so uh, it really yeah. is a silent salesman. My first book, it brought in passive income. Uh, it helped me get on Business Insider and the Huffington Post, it helped me do podcast interviews like this. I mean, people started to take me seriously. I was 19 years old. I was a college dropout, and people would take my calls. They would invite me on their podcast. They would do all these things all because I was a best-selling author. Uh, and, I mean, it helped me build a 4,000-person email list where I could it helped, you know, sell other products. It helped me build a business on the back end. I mean, I was talking with uh, Brian Tracy, you know, like legendary – uh, personal yeah. uh, development g guru guy. Uh, and uh, he, he said, you know, I like to say, you know how there's a, uh, AD and BC or BC and AD. It's like um, before Christ and after death, you know what it stands for. He said, I like to yeah. say there's uh, BB and AD before, <laughs> before book, book and after book. After <laughs> book. And then it's, I found that same thing to be true is like I can separate my life into two very distinct times there was the time the 19 years before i had my first book and then there was the four years since i had my uh, first book and there's a lot of millions of dollars in those four years and there's zero yeah. millions of dollars in those other 19 years so while you've been training people have you found because I, I always feel like and this is just personally speaking like you shouldn't write a book unless you're really good with English or you aspire to be an author or something like that. So I'm curious the kind of people that you help write books and are a lot of them just people you would have never who would have never thought that they'd be writing a book and and how's that you know changed them for the better? It's a that's a, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, that's exactly the type of person uh, and it's it's your average Joe. It's someone who said, "Hey, I have some expertise. I, I feel like I've learned mm -hmm. something in my life that I want to share with others." Or, you know, I want to grow my business. I want to grow my income. So I, I feel like I can write a book. And that those are the people who often do it. It's not anyone that has a PhD or is an English major or who's just spectacular at the written word. Uh, it's average people. And you, you, maybe you've heard the saying that the, the, the best player is oftentimes not the best coach. Uh, but oftentimes uh, some of the worst players are the best coaches. And I consider that to be the case for myself. You know, I feel like I, I think I mentioned this on the top of the interview, which is, you know, I sucked at English and I sucked at writing. I wasn't good at it and I hated it. And my friends would take uh, an hour, two, maybe three hours to write a, a full paper and they would turn it in and get an A. I would be up all night in the library, uh, taking Adderall, like trying to focus uh, just to get a paper done. And then I would turn it in and I'd get a C or a D. Right, so it didn't come easy for me. Therefore, uh, I believe that I kind of learned the hard way, and I can I can simplify the process to where anyone can understand it. I mean, anyone. It's like if if I'm about to release my sixth book, uh, then uh, if you're listening to this right now, you're listening to a podcast, which means you're smart, uh, and that means that you have all the smarts <laughs> yep. that you need uh, to write a book. Absolutely love it. Um, so let's talk more about your dropout story here. I want to go a bit more into depth mm -hmm. with that. So tell us how you came, I mean, kind of the period before you dropped out and all the way up to that point and that whole decision process on your end. Yeah, uh, this is great. I love talking about this. Uh, so for me, I always knew that when I went into school, I wasn't going for the degree. I was going for the learning. So I said, if at any point my business is successful, and, and I feel like I've gotten the learning that I needed, I'll drop out. But it, there's a very big difference con uh, conceptually between saying that to yourself like, oh, yeah, I'll totally drop out. And then getting down to the point where you drop out <laughs> and you literally right. just don't come back to class. Uh, like There's a big difference, especially, I mean, I feel like dropout often has this negative connotation where I know for the first year after I dropped out, I always said, yeah, I'm a... I, like I'm a college dropout, but like I'm running this company, <laughs> right? I always felt yeah. like I had to kind of deflect it to say like, <laughs> trust me, I'm not a loser. I have a book and I have a company, <laughs> right? So 
there, there's this negative stigma. So I feel like there's a big difference, like I said, between conceptually dropping out and then actually doing it. So for a while I said, I'm just here for the learning. And then, uh, but it's a funny thing, right? You say, oh, when my business is successful, well, your business is oftentimes not successful because you can't actually focus on it. Uh, and so I just remember, you know, I was doing the student painter thing, which is where I hit six figures for my first, uh, my first time. Yeah. Um, and I was doing that whole thing. And then finally, my buddy, we got back from this conference and he said, hey, when are you going to drop out? Just point blank, just ask, like, when are you going to just finally drop out? And it kind of hit me. Uh, and I actually got to think about it. And I said, well, then I started to come up with all these objections, right? Where I was like, oh, no, 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 I'll just finish early. That was my, that was the yeah. better option. And I started thinking about that. And I was like, that sounds miserable, that would be horrible. And so then my next thought process was, well, if it's not worth finishing early, then why is it worth finishing at all? Uh, is it worth finishing at all? And I really wrestled with that. And because my mom would always call and she'd say, Chandler, you're working yourself to death. Like you're not sleeping much. You're doing all this. You're running this business. You're doing all this extracurricular stuff. Like, why don't you just drop that? Chill out with that. Um, so that you, you know, you're not just like sleep deprived and working like crazy. And I was like, mom, I don't think you understand. Yeah. That is what gives me life. That's the reason why I'm living. Like, I, I, I can't wake up and get jazzed up about schoolwork. So all that kind of came to a head, and I said, you know what? This actually isn't worth worth finishing. And so the 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 key thing for me was I got tired of learning how to run a business from professors who had never ran a business. That didn't really make mm. much sense to me. And I knew that I was learning so much more by actually running a business and from mentors who had done what I wanted to do. So there's only so many times where you can ask the question to a professor and say, hey, this is really cool. Not being sarcastic, but just saying, hey, this is great. How have you used this in your business? And then when you have them say, oh, I've never ran a business, then instantly for me, I'm like, well, this semester's over. I'm not paying attention to anything <laughs> else you say. Uh, but it's the whole uh, you know, I like to learn from people who have done what I want to do, not who are just teaching from theory. So that was the final straw for me. I decided to drop out. Uh, I had written, well, I, you'll get a kick out of this. I decided to drop out, but I always wanted to study abroad. Uh, and I, I got to think, I'm like, man, if I drop out, that means I won't get to study abroad because that's like a senior, uh, <laughs> senior first semester or junior second semester, right? Thing that you do that. Right. And I said, well, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to, study abroad, see Europe on the school's dime, and then I'm going to drop out. Uh, and so that's what I did. And I went to Austria. <laughs> I studied abroad for a semester. Uh, it was a time of introspection because I knew I wanted to start a business, but I didn't know what that business would be. And so I said, okay, I'm going to take three months to kind of do some soul searching, and then I'm going to come out guns blazing, uh, and we're going to do this thing. And, it, and it's game on. So that's what ultimately happened. I dropped out and uh, the final chapter to that story is I moved halfway across the country uh, into uh, an entrepreneur house with a bunch of other guys uh, running businesses uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, of all places. And Because for me, and I think this will be helpful for people who are either considering dropping out or maybe they already have, for me, I said, I'm not going to stay in my college town and I'm not going to go back to my hometown. Either one of those would be way too easy because it's way too – it's like – my my hypothesis was if I'm going to fail at dropping out, which sounds hilarious to say out loud, but if I'm going to fail at dropping out, I'm going to fail really, really hard. Uh, so there's yeah. I'm going to sink the ships, burn the bridges. There's no no turning back. So that's why I moved halfway across the country. It was like this big ordeal where it wasn't just, oh, yeah, I'm going to stop school for a little while and stay living in this apartment with all my buddies who still go to school. I think that's a recipe uh, – for failure for most people, unless you have in, insane discipline. Uh, and so hmm. that's why I decided to make that decision. Man. Yeah. I love that mindset. I just finished reading the book shoe dog, which is about Phil Knight, uh, the founder of Nike. And that's one of the things when he was building Nike, that was his mindset is I want to fail as fast and as hard as I can. And man, it's an incredible story. If you get a chance to read the book, guys do it. But long story short, you know, you know what Nike is today. So, yeah. Um, so did you write the book then after you dropped out? No, it was actually uh, – I wrote it right before and finished it up as I started studying abroad. So I actually okay. pressed publish in Austria, and I, this was kind of like mm. the light bulb moment where I was snowboarding all day, and I came back to my little dorm, and the book had made 400 bucks that day. 
And I looked at that and I was like, get out of here. This is, this is passive income, right? This is this thing I read about in Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. I, you know, his equation is real estate equals passive income. But I was yeah. like, this is passive income equals a book. Who would have thought that? Digital products, right? And, and then you start to see the book sells 80, 100, 170 copies a day. And that's when I realized for me that, hey, this isn't just my mom, my grandma, and their friends buying this book anymore. This is real life people all around the world in countries, sorry about that, in countries all around the world that are buying this book. And, and that's, what, that's when the light bulb went off for me. And I was like, this is really cool. I'm going to do more of this. Fantastic, man. I'm curious, how did your friends and family react to your decision to drop out? Were they supportive? Yes. Uh, I think the, well, some of them. Uh, it, it's yeah. one of those things where my parents are awesome. I mean, they are unbelievable. I wrote a whole book about my parents and the lessons that they taught me with my brother. Uh, it's called Breaking Out of a Broken System. But they're unbelievable. I mean, they met at a factory uh, when they were younger and they ended up getting married and they basically clawed their way out of poverty and created an, uh, an amazing life for me and my brother, uh, just, just blue collar type. I mean, from, I'm from South Carolina in the middle of nowhere. Like they just really put their foot down and, and created a new life for me and my brother. And I'll forever be wow. grateful for that. And what, what they did, um, is gosh, um, the, so they, they, I feel like it was the right mixture where they challenged me up front and they asked me a bunch of questions. And then once they realized that I was serious and this wasn't like one of those, ah, screw this, I'm quitting school kind of, you know, like everyone's had that yeah. thought. It, it was more than that. I had actually talked to mentors about it. I'd got, I'd, uh, I'd uh, seeked out some counsel on it and things like that. They said, they question, question, question. And then once they got all the answers that they wanted, they said, cool, we're hundred percent supportive. Uh, what can we do to help? And so that was unbelievable because I think it's really, really hard. And a lot of people listening to this have probably been through that where it's super hard if you don't have that support to like be confident in yourself. And then you also, when, if and when you do drop out, then you're like second guessing, second guessing it even more because you're like, I don't want to fail because then uh, they're going to be like, I told you so, that sort of thing. And so that was really helpful. But then on the flip side, I mean, I had a, some extended family. I had friends. I had uh, people who I hadn't talked to in forever call me up and say, hey, this is a dumb idea. You shouldn't do this. Stay in school and get your degree. Uh, and I said, well, great to talk to you. I haven't talked to you in a while. And that's a great idea. <laughs> cool. Thank you for sharing. Click. I'm not doing that. Right. So, yeah. yes, people will come out of the woodworks to tell you it's not a, an idea. Uh, not a good idea, but those are the same people. It's kind of like the whole saying, like, don't let people shoot down your dream just because it's too big for them to comprehend. I think that's what happens a lot of times. And my my theory was if I'm going to go places where other people haven't gone and do things that other people haven't done, then why would I take the same path that everyone else takes? So mm. that was my theory with dropping out. And, and yeah, people doubted it. People um, told me it was a dumb idea, but they, at the end of the day, I just truly believe that it was the... Uh, it was the uh, just the best move that I could make. After you dropped out, you know, obviously you would experienced some success uh, in the entrepreneurial side of things before you dropped out. But after you did, did you have any fears? And if so, what were they? And and how did you manage those? Oh, totally, tons of fears. I mean, I I feared that it was a bad idea, and now I'd fail, and that and I would have to come crawling back to school with my tail between my legs. <laughs> uh, that was my biggest fear, and. Really, the fear that all those people who came out of the woodwork to tell me that it was a bad idea, that they would be right. Uh, and mm. that was my biggest fear. It's my, I feared that I would fail, um, that I was making the wrong decision, that I should have stayed in school. I mean, I had basically a year of second guessing myself uh, until I started becoming successful. And it was the roughest, hardest year of my life. But I actually think that's what accelerated my success is putting, I mean, I had the same oh crap feeling that all of my friends had and that everyone has when they graduate it's like oh shoot oh yeah i've got to actually <laughs> function in the real world now uh yeah. what do i do but i had that feeling two years earlier so i you know by the time they were all graduating i was like oh yeah i remember that two years ago <laughs> you know and i was at right. my it accelerated my learning curve and i'll say this on that is um uh, 
most people, I could have finished my degree for $7,000 in tuition and plus living expenses because I had some scholarships and stuff. And most people, they'll say, and they did say, you're an idiot. It's $7,000 and you're going to have a degree and except yeah. you're not, you know, why would you not do that? Because that's really cheap in the grand scheme of things. And I said, well, yeah, that is. But I'm looking at the opportunity cost of these two years of my life. And the opportunity yeah. cost is way greater uh, than than any any of those things. Because uh, than that seven thousand dollars. Because I I ran hundreds of thousands of dollars in in businesses by the time my friends even graduated school. So it's like. Right. That's a lot better than than the seven thousand dollars in tuition. So, to circle back around to your question, yes, I had a ton of fears, uh, and I faced those daily. But eventually, they went away as I kept chipping away at it. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned it was only seven grand to finish up and stuff. It's that's that sunk cost fallacy. Yes, is, is what that's called, and people think just because they put X amount of money into something. If they're almost done, they've got to just finish it through mm-hmm. instead of if it's a really a bad thing, you know, you should just it's a fallacy. I mean, you got to cut it yeah. off as soon as possible. So, if people aren't familiar with that, you should just google that really quick sunk cost fallacy. It's it's fascinating and it'll just kind of maybe uh shift your mindset a bit. You must um, be an economics but, guy. Uh At no. At least you just paid I mean, attention sure. in that class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I'll tell you what I remember about sunk cost fallacy. Maybe this would be helpful for people. Yeah. I I I have a weird mind, but I remember my professor saying, explaining sunk cost fallacy, and that's exactly what I thought about when I dropped out of school. Because I remember um, the teacher, she said, okay, imagine you bought a ticket for a movie or a sporting event or whatever. And then in the parking lot, you lost that ticket. And then you go up to the, the counter. Should you buy another one? And, and her whole argue, it's the whole sunk cost fallacy, right? It's like, well, you already paid yeah. that. Like, that's irrelevant as to whether or not you want to see the movie or not. It's just yeah. a matter of is the movie worth the money that you want to pay? But people get so hung up on the fact that they lost the ticket already that ac- that actually affects their decision when it shouldn't affect their decision. And that was a similar, mm-hmm. you know, that's like such an elementary example. But I always remember that stuck in my head. And I was thinking, you know, yes, I have sunk two years in quite a bit of time, uh, and, and stuff into this, but is it, what's the opportunity cost on the other end? Yeah. So you'd mentioned earlier that that first year was really tough. And I want to ask you that question is what exactly did you do then after you dropped out for that first six months to a year? Because that is a really scary time for people. You're in the real world. You got to make, you got to make stuff happen. So what was that like for you? what did you do? I tried to make it work. I, I moved into an entrepreneur house um, with a guy that uh, named Dame Maxwell, uh, he started a company called The Foundation. Uh, and so The Foundation, it was this online training company. Uh, and I was paying more for that training company. It was like 800 bucks a month. I was, training more, I was paying more for that than I was for my rent in college. And everyone said I was stupid and crazy. And they're like, why would you do that? But then I ended up getting to meet him. And then I moved into an entrepreneur house with him. Uh, and then I learned from guys who were doing what I wanted to do. Uh, and I worked from home. I woke up every morning and then figured out that you probably shouldn't just wear lounge shorts and whatever because, you know, it's the whole uh, look good, feel good kind of thing. So then I started uh, putting my work clothes on uh, every single day to try and get in that mindset, get up, uh, do do my thing. And and for the first little bit, actually, I was working on this charity project. It was a book um, that I mentioned earlier, Breaking Out of a Broken System, and it was – the, all the money went to charity. It was buy one book, save one life. Uh, and then my friends were all kind of like, dude, what are you doing? You're spending all your time on this charity project and you need to make some money. Uh, but it, it ended up working out because that led into what I was doing with self-publishing school. But, you know, you're just, you're just trying, or I was just trying things, failing, trying things, failing, trying things, failing. And eventually you start to, I, I felt it's like a, I was like a dog trying to get on the scent uh, of an animal where it's like, all right, I'm yeah, just roaming that's around. A good way like, to put it. Yeah. Eventually, eventually you will get on that scent and then you can follow that scent. And even when you're following that scent, like you just feel like you're on the right path, but you don't know if you're on the right path. Uh, and then eventually you, you kind of get to where, where you need to go, but it's a lot of trial and error and a lot of failing forward. So did you, when you went into that 
entrepreneur house, did you know that you wanted to start a business around publishing or were you just trying all sorts of different directions for that? Year? Definitely not. I was trying to start a productivity course off the back of my book because we built a 4,000 person email list. Oh yeah. Oh. Ba- off of one book. And I was like, okay, well we have emails and we have nothing to sell them. So we should create something about productivity. So we tried that and it just failed hard. Uh, and then, you know, it's like you can only fail for so long. Uh, and then, it, well, I was failing and you can only have so many people slap you in the face and, and, and say, Hey, we're interested in this. And so I'm over here on this failing business. Meanwhile, people are like, Hey, how are you doing this whole book thing? How how is this so successful? Because uh, I'd done basically three books in six months, where I'd I'd published one of my own, I published two of my own, and I helped a friend do his, and his was successful too. And so people kept asking, I just kept getting on the phone with people, and I'd say, I'd get on for an hour, and I'd say, here's everything I know about how to write and publish a book. Uh, good luck. Hope it goes well. And then just that I got out of the goodness of my heart, I, I wasn't charging me anything. I was just like, hey, here's what you need to do. You need to do this and then do this and do this and do this. It's like a broken record, having the same conversation right. over and over again. And then it's like, like I said, you can only get smacked in the face so many times or smacked in the butt so many times before you turn around and you say, oh, interesting. People keep asking about this. Maybe I should try and charge for it. So that's when I kind of stumbled my way into what we called at the time best-selling book system, uh, which we it's now self-publishing school, uh, and so uh, that's uh, that's what we did, and uh, we we pre-sold the course before we had anything. Uh, we sold 44 students, uh, and we had we brought in 86 thousand dollars with that first uh, little seed launch kind of thing, uh, and then. Then we said, okay, this is validation. Then we we had this cohort of 44 students. We ran them through, uh, and within six months, over 60% had written a published, a, written and published a book. Like within six months, and that's when I mean that's the, just for context for people. The average course is uh, you're lucky if you get 10% of people to even open the course. It's like people buy this, uh, and it's for their shelf esteem. Uh, and they buy it and put it up on the shelf. Shelf esteem. <laughs> forget about it. All right. I like that. Uh, so that they feel good about themselves the day that they buy that course. Uh, and so I saw this si- over sixty percent success rate within six months, and I was like, "This is unbelievable." So that for me was kind of the kicker. That's when I said, "Okay, I can get behind this because I can't sell something that I don't believe in and that I don't know works." Um, kind of like the whole. Uh, why I dropped out of school is because I didn't want to learn from people who hadn't what I wanted to do. I, I not only wanted to do what I'm teaching, but then also know that what I'm teaching works. Uh, and so that's, um, that's, that's what we did. And the success rate was high. And then I said, all right, cool, let's scale this puppy. Uh, and that's what we've been doing ever since. So I, I want to come back to that a bit, but I want to take a little detour here because you sound like a very ambitious, motivated guy. You sound like you're always go, go, go. And do you get eight hours of sleep a night? Uh, my goal was seven and a half. Uh, this, if I'm being yeah. frank, uh, I have, I've been lax on this and I'm, I was actually thinking about this just yesterday about how I'm going to be more disciplined tonight to go to bed. Um, I have a bedtime alarm that, I know this is like a new feature on the iPhone, but I was doing this before the new feature yeah. on the iPhone, just for the record. Uh, I, I, I got this uh, idea from my buddy. Uh, and he's because really the most I mean the, the biggest reason people don't get sleep or on the flip side that they don't wake up early is because they don't go to bed early enough. So for me, uh, I'm an old man, but about nine o'clock that alarm rings off and it says, "Hey, you should start to like get in motion of the, like start winding it down." So that basically gives me about an hour to get into bed and then um, thirty minutes to kind of wind down, and my goal is to be asleep by ten thirty, up at six, seven and a half hours, and uh, following with a REM cycle of an hour and a half REM cycles. So you know you sleep in, and it, it's different per person. So you should. This is not a blanket statement, um, but I found that seven and a half hours is kind of like the magic formula for me. And then throw in a nine hour, like once a week or I usually don't get that, but every other week or whatever. And that kind of is, is, a, is the right recipe for me. Do you ever have a day where you just, just lazy, just get in your sweats and watch Netflix or something like that? Uh, yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes like on the weekend or something. And then I, I rarely, rarely I'll have one where it's just like, I don't feel like doing anything that's usually when i'm disconnected from my why and why i'm doing what i'm doing and but i will say those especially happened 
when I was in the dropout phase pre having success with my business because I didn't know it was going to work. And so you just get those days where you start to get really, really discouraged. Yeah. So self-publishing school, you mentioned that the goal is to disrupt the publishing industry. So how are you going about that? I'm curious. Uh, Because our goal is to show people that self-publishing isn't just an option. It's the best option. Uh, So we're, I feel like, making strides in that direction. Uh, And ultimately, the way we're going to put the publishers out of business is it's going to make more economic sense uh, for someone to write and self-publish their book than it does to traditionally publish. It's moving in that direction. The market's moving in that direction. We're pushing it in that direction. Uh, And so that's kind of how we're going about it. I mean, the, the publishing industry is antiquated. Uh, They relied on this one little bottleneck in the industry, which was distribution. And the only reason you would do a publishing deal is because you wanted to get distribution into bookstores. Well, guess what? Uh, Most, most, not, yeah, most of the bookstores are going out of business. I mean, Barnes & Noble is is dying a slow death. And so that once power struggle that happened because they had that distribution is now almost irrelevant through Amazon and through other digital retailers. So they've kind of disrupted the publishing industry uh, in that way, and and we're showing people how to hey, you can do this yourself, and here's exactly how you need to do it, um, because you know if you're you're going to get taken advantage of if you go with a big publisher. So our our goal is really to put the power back into the hands of the people, uh, much like people who are dropping out want to put their power in their own hands, much like people who are starting a business want to put their power in their own hands. We believe the same exists for people who want to write a book. So you've talked books up a lot, and I, I, see the, I see the merit. I'd love to write one myself someday. For somebody listening who's, who's curious about that, do you have any just quick tips you can share on how to come up with something to write about? Mm, something to write about. So a few things there. Now, if you run a business, that could be, this could be the questions that always get asked. So what are your clients mm-hmm. always asking about? What's the, what's the broken record conversation that you have to onboard every new uh, new uh, customer or what are the objections yeah. that they have prior to choosing your business so I've always told my mom she's a realtor I said hey mom you need to write the 10 mistakes to avoid when when uh, buying real estate in Oconee County South Carolina right so it's like yeah. it's, it's a niche book it establishes Very her niche. or or even like the 10 mistakes to avoid when choosing a realtor to sell your house I mean imagine that yeah. I'm about to sell my house I see that book I would say, all right, well, 10 minutes. And this is pain. You know, they say it's easier to sell pain pills than it is to sell vitamins. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Uh, but it's easier to no, sell I pain haven't. pills That's, than it is to sell yeah. vitamins. Because think about it. I'm in pain. I'm always looking for this when I'm marketing. Like, what's going to make me whip out my credit card and beg you to take it? It's when I'm in pain. And so because of that, you have pain pills that sell themselves. But then when you look at vitamins, you've got, geez, kids vitamins you've got bears that are like all kinds of shapes there are all kinds of flavors there are all kinds of colors because they're so hard to sell uh, and you have to make uh, vitamins sexy which uh, so it's easier to sell pain pills than it is to sell vitamins so that's why i say the 10 mistakes to avoid like if i'm going that route so that's one way you can go if you have a business you could go write about what you're passionate about what are you always talking about what's your soapbox uh, what are the, what's the hobby that you have the thing that you enjoy or even what's something that like your friends know you for and they always come to you for advice or maybe they've even said hey you should write a book about that right interesting so uh, you know as an entrepreneur obviously it's a lot like a roller coaster there's ups and downs <laughs> share with us uh, a quick story of what you'd consider to be your worst entrepreneurial moment to date Oh man, uh, there's two that come to mind besides, uh, besides the two that have happened in the last week <laughs> and that happened every week, <laughs> uh, the temporary ups True and downs, uh, uh, gosh, one of the biggest ones was, uh, in February of this January, February of this year. Um, I showed up to our company retreat. Uh, I found out uh, that, and I found out uh, that my business partner was trying to kick me out of the business. Found out from one of my employees, uh, and that was kind of a kick in the pants. And I and I said, "Well, that's interesting. I definitely didn't know that." Uh, and so then confronted him, and then we went through a month of mediation. We negotiated a buyout. I bought him out of the company. Uh, I wired the largest sum of money that I've ever wired in my life, uh, and. 
I went debt, and I'm talking pretty significant uh, multi six figure debt um, for the first time in my life. And the tough part was the the in between. So from the time where I found out he's trying to kick me out of the business to when we actually negotiated that buyout, it was the not knowing. So the full month of February for for me was. Am I even going to have this business? Is it going to go to him? Is it going to get dissolved because we can't agree on something? Like, what's going to happen? And what I realized then was my identity was my business. My identity was tied to my business, which is not healthy, obviously, because when business is good, your identity is good. When business is bad, your identity is bad. And this is why you end up with so many, you know, 40 to 50 year olds corporate employees who get laid off and then they become depressed and commit suicide, right? Because their identity is in their work. So mm. I had to do a lot of soul searching for that month. I mean, I went snowboarding, I went on hikes. I mean, I, mean, I work a lot, uh, a lot, a lot. And for that month, I said, screw it. Uh, I'm going to do the bare minimum. I might not even keep this business. So why would I work that hard? <laughs> you know? And so I really took some time to think like, okay, why is this so feeling so weird? Why am I so wrecked by that? And that's when I realized, oh, it's because my identity is my business and this is not healthy. So I really dug into that. And that's probably one of the toughest uh, times of my life, other than times when businesses were failing and all of my bank accounts were negative and I had half of my team quit and student. I mean, this is like goes on and on and on and on. But, uh, uh, we we could record like five more podcast episodes with all of my failures and low moments, but that's the that's the biggest one that comes to mind. Yeah. Now, how about on the flip side, uh, more of an aha moment? You know, a period where something just clicked in your mind and it changed kind of the course of events, the way you thought, the way you did things. Multiple. When I published my first book, the whole story that I've already told, where it's like, yeah. oh wow, this is passive income, that sort of thing. There was another one where I had a I had a goal when I joined Student Painters, um, you know. So there's it's a it's a national company. There's people all over the country starting and running a, a painting company to paint houses, right? So my goal when I joined, I said as a rookie, I want to be the number one in the company uh, and number one in the country for all managers, uh, and that was my sole goal. And I went through all these trials and tribulations to get to that, and I said I want to hit six figures. Um, and I ended up at 102, $102,000 in business, and I hit, uh, I hit number one in the company. And I remember being on the cruise, wow. and we had the rewards banquet, and I got the trophy. Uh, and I remember just like being on top and just looking out at the ocean and just like kind of just reflecting and sitting and just thinking like, man, this is unbelievable. I, because I, I, I knew I, at that point I knew what it took to get there. When I made that goal, I didn't know what it was going to take to get to that point. Uh, but mm -hmm. you know, I had like half my team quit. I had like all these really tough moments. But it, it, that was the aha moment where I said, you know what, Chandler, you've been selling yourself short. And if you can do this, what else can you do? And it really kind of like that's when it started to creep in. Like, okay, should I drop out and you know things like that? Because I was like, man, this is this is pretty neat. Uh, like. You know, I set my mind to this goal, and now it's happening. And so that's one of the biggest aha, aha moments that I can think of. Fantastic, man. So Chandler, this is one of my uh, favorite questions to ask. If you could time travel back to day one of your entrepreneurial journey and have 10 minutes with your former self to communicate any lessons you've acquired with the intention of saving yourself mistakes and heartache, what would you tell yourself? <clears throat> there would be two main lessons. Learn to sell. That's the biggest lesson that I learned uh, when I was going on broke is I said, oh, there's a light bulb moment for me where I said, if I know how to sell and how to market, I will never be broke a day in my life. Uh, I'll always have a job if I, if I need it and I can write my own paycheck because people always need more customers and they always need more business. And I was thinking to myself, why am I failing right now? Because I can't drive customers and because I can't drive business. So uh, th that was the aha moment, and I devoted my time. Uh, I've read every marketing and especially copywriting, so salesmanship in print. Uh, I read every book on copywriting I could find. I hand wrote copy an hour a day for three months straight. Um, I was going through copywriting courses and really honed this skill of selling because if you can sell, you, can, you, you know, the problem in my business for the last year and a half uh, has, has been too much sales 
and not enough fulfillment. So we have to keep pumping the brakes and say, like, okay, we need to like get our internal systems good before we can sell more, which I think that's a good problem to have because you have the money yeah. to, to, to pay people to do stuff you don't like to do, you don't want to do, or you're not good at, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's the first thing I would tell myself. Uh, and then the second thing would be to create systems uh, in, in your business. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm seeing that uh, system sign right <laughs> behind you. So I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. That's it. <laughs> Um, but that was the, that was the aha moment. And I continue to have the aha moment where it's just like every book that I read, whether it was the E-Myth, uh, work the system or millionaire fast lane or whatever, they always talk about systems and how wealth and business success, it isn't an event. Everyone wants to look at the event when you sell or when you, you know, get bought out or like, you know, it's this event where rain just, or money just falls from the sky. Right. But that's yeah. sexy. That's what makes the news. What people don't see and they don't know oftentimes exists is the process that led to that and the systems. The only reason someone else will buy your company is because it's you're, you're selling them a system that they can continue to run or that can run without even them, right? So mm -hmm. um, I feel like I wasted days, months, years of my life just doing one-off activity and not systematizing things. And even up until this day, we're still, as in my company, like we're getting it honed in, uh, but it would be to create systems and systematize things because that's the only way you're going to be able to free yourself up. Yeah, that's a true statement, man. Uh, moving more into kind of the lightning round here, what's a personal habit that contributes to your success? Hands down, my miracle morning. So my morning routine, um, there's a book called The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. It's, it's yeah. um, unbelievable. And that's, I mean, that's, the day I started my miracle morning is the day that everything changed for me. Hmm. Now this is uh, excluding your own books because we'll 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 promote those. But what's what's a book that you'd recommend to us and and why? <laughs> Man, you had to give me that caveat. Huh? Um, <laughs> there's so many. I'm a big reader. I read about a book a week. Um, and yeah, throw a couple out there. Gosh. So I, I just talked about how sales is so important. So I'll say Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Cialdini. That's a really, really good one. Uh, and then I'm going to go with a super lame answer. Uh, and it's only because I'm about to go through it again. But that's Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And it's one that like you've heard that probably a million times. But I didn't read that until like a year and a half ago. And I just, every page, I, I was thinking to myself, how have I not read this book yet? So I want to kind of like put that bug back in people's ear because this one you've probably heard a thousand times, but I would guess that a lot of people haven't actually read the book. Uh, so I highly recommend it. Yeah, I, I love that book to, to this day. I still, all of my goals and stuff are defined by the, the roles that I have in life and stuff. So it made a big impact on me, but I'm curious, is it, it was a tough read for me. I don't know what it was about, oh, it's about super that fun. book, but yeah. And yeah. I don't know. I listen to a lot of audio books too. And I think that's definitely one you should probably get the, get the actual physical book. <laughs> yeah. That's actually when I, I, it's funny you say that cause I read the physical book and it was great. And now I'm about to listen to the audio book, like probably yeah. starting within the next week. I've already downloaded it on my phone. Like, cause I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do the, Space repetition, but uh, I, nothing. If you think that Seven Habits of Highly Successful People is long and tough to get through, then you need to read Influence by Robert Cialdini. That is a hard book yeah. to get through. Uh, that <laughs> that is like slogging through it, but it's really, really good. I'll have to check that out. Out of curiosity, do you read physical books or or do Audible mostly? Oh, for sure, for both? sure. I I just got back on the audiobook train with Student Painters. I was doing a bunch of driving to to all my managers and stuff. So I would listen, you know, uh, Mobile University, like listening in the car all the time. Uh, yep. But now it's it's almost all physical, and then I also do some audio here or there. Um, and I've started doing that. So that's, I, I really love physical. I love the analog. I love writing in books and then I do put together what I call summary and action sheets. So it's a single sheet of, of paper. Uh, and basically there's a summary and, and all the, all the notes that I take as I read on the page. And then there's a small little box in the right hand corner and it's small on purpose 
because that means I can only fit three to five things, and these are the action steps, the things that I'm going to do to implement this book. And so now I've got this huge catalog where if I ever want to review what I've learned or if I want to hold myself accountable on, okay, did I actually take these action steps, then I can go back and review those summary and action sheets. Would you mind, you don't have to if you don't want to, but you would you mind sharing like a copy of that and we could maybe put it on the show notes? I think that'd be really yep. valuable to, yep. to share with people. Yep, I can do that. I don't know, there's like a cam scanner app that I use all the time that, you know, scans something into a PDF, but something like that, I think that'd be really cool. I love stuff yeah, like I'll that. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll send that to you right after this. Fantastic, man. All right, last two questions here. Um a word of advice, what, what parting piece of advice would you have for any of our listeners who are thinking of dropping out, um, but they haven't quite made that step yet? Whew. Have a nest egg, bust your butt to make some freaking money and put it in the bank. Then strip down your expenses as far as you can go um, so that you have a runway. Have six months of runway. Because if, if you don't, you're operating from a place of scarcity and you're going to scramble and you're going to compromise your values. One of the best things that I did is I had months and months and months of runway because I'd been running these companies and I'd saved and saved and saved. And so save and, and get yourself some runway. Um, otherwise, luckily, my run, I mean, my runway ran out and all of my bank accounts were negative and I'd borrowed $15,000 from friends and family the month that I launched self-publishing school, which we did $180,000. So it was literally, if that would have failed, I would have <laughs> failed and I'm going back to live with mom and dad. I might go back to school. Like, I don't know what Some I'm doing. Thin margins there. <laughs> it, you know, that was at the end of the rope. So luckily I had enough rope to get me that long. Uh, and that, so that, I think that's one of the, the best things that you can do. And then you know, you just got to get out there and do it. Like if you're going to do it, do it. And if you think you need to do it and, and you have this burning desire, then I don't care what your parents say. I don't care what your friends say. I don't care what anyone says. Like if you know you need to do it, then you need to do it. But if you're going to do it, don't halfway do it. You know, like I mentioned earlier, don't, don't, don't stay in your frat house with your buddies uh, and, you know, continue living that life while being out of school. Because guess what? You're going to be back in school within a year. Uh, you're going to be a loser. You're not going to get anything done. Um, and so if, you, if you're going to do it, you need to actually do it. Get some runway and then make it happen. Now how about a parting piece of advice for people that have already dropped out and are already on that entrepreneurial journey? Uh, it's, I'd say, um, you're, you know, there's a decent chance that you're struggling right now because you, you struggle before it gets good. Uh, and, and don't don't think that just because you haven't been successful after say a month, two months, three months, even six months that you are a failure. You're not a failure, you just haven't figured it out yet. And I, if I would have given up after six months, nine months, even a year, I would have quit right before the finish line, or not before the finish line, but I would have quit right before a breakthrough, right? So uh, keep fighting the good fight uh, and, and keep your head up Listen to an audio book called Maximum Confidence because that's what you need in this time right now as a dropout is you need confidence because if your confidence, confidence is down, you can't do anything. Uh, and oftentimes your confidence is down when you think that you're going to just float your way into millions uh, and be the next dropout to millionaire success story. But that doesn't happen overnight. You need, to, you need the confidence and you need the stamina to really uh, make it through uh, that time after dropping out. Yeah. Yeah, don't stop three feet from gold. Yes. So I want to I wanna promote your, your new book here, Published. Tell us really quick what that's about and then how people can connect with you. Yes, uh, so the book's called Published. It's the proven path from blank page to published author. So this is the book that I wish I had when I wrote my first book. It really is a step-by-step -step process for how you can write, market, and publish your first book in 90 days and then use that book to grow your income, your authority, and your business. Uh, it's, it's the definitive guide. It's what I've learned from uh, teaching thousands of people through this process, through my program, Self-Publishing School. Uh, it's what I've learned from doing five books myself. You know, this is my sixth book. And I really do feel like this is one of those things that if you're just looking for a step-by-step -step process and, and you think maybe you don't even know if you want to quite do it, but you think you might want to do it, then you should check out the book. Um, it, it's, uh, it'll be on Amazon. Uh, and also, um, we've got some free copies for a little while longer. Um, you can check them out at self-publishing, 
publishingschool.com forward slash published. Um, that's dash publishing school dot com forward slash published and uh, we got some free copies over there fantastic man well successful dropouts you've been hanging out with chandler and kylan learning what it takes to drop out grind and succeed for everything we talked about today head over to successful com and type chandler into the search bar and the show notes will pop right up and as always stay hungry stay foolish boom For more information about how to drop out, grind, and succeed, go to SuccessfulDropout.com. I also love questions. If you have a question about anything we talked about today, I want to hear from you. Go to SuccessfulDropout.com and click the Ask Me a Question link at the top of the page. Successful Dropouts, if you could go to iTunes and leave a positive rating and review, it would help this show out a lot. I know you're busy. I know you got a lot going on. But if you do that, it helps this podcast rank. It helps other people listen to it and gain value just like you have been. Thank you so much in advance.